All right, welcome back to Church on the Rock. It's good to have you guys here today. Um, we will be in Acts chapter 5, however, we are going to um, recap a little bit on chapter 4 because it's weird the way chapter 5 starts out. It's kind of like it maybe should have been in chapter 4, but nobody asked me whenever they were laying that out. So, But um, before we get into that, uh, I wanted to remind everybody that we are... Uh, participating in the Adopt a Street initiative with all the other churches, well, maybe not all, but several other churches in the Harrisonville area to literally win the community for Christ. And we've got some, uh, some information on that in the back. We also are going to do some prayer time before we roll into that next month. Um, and so if that's something that you're passionate about, that you want to help impact your community, and you want to help uh, just develop relationship and bring people into the kingdom of God, then we've got some information for you. Also, next Wednesday, I haven't told Becky yet, so she might not be real thrilled about this. I haven't given her a heads up, but uh, we are going to be starting back up our men's Bible study, and uh, you can join in on Zoom, or you can come meet here at the church at 6.30 in the morning. I know some of you are like, 6.30, oh good, it's not going to be real early, but yeah, I'm, it is 6.30 in the morning, so you can get up and come join us. It should be a lot of fun. Sometimes Paul shows up and brings those, uh, what are those sausage things? Rolled, oh my gosh. Oh, they're amazing. They're amazing. Ron, you should maybe come down and visit us sometime. Ron's a good friend of mine from up in Blue Springs, and he decided to come down and join us today, and he's always on our men's Bible study in the morning as well. Awesome dude. It's great to see you. I love you, man. All right. So, let's jump into the end of Acts chapter 4. I think we're going to, we're going to hit a couple different verses just to kind of set the stage, and you will find that uh, Peter and John are back in jail. So, if they were living here today in our community and stuff, it might be a little hard for them to get a job because they seem to be in and out of jail quite a bit. And in the legal world, uh, we would call that frequent flyers, unless you wanted to be politically correct, and then it would be repeat offender. But I'm not always politically correct, so take that as you will. But these guys are they're in jail again. And they're in jail because they're preaching the Word of God. They're sharing Jesus. And they've been told, you can't do this anymore. You can't be, you can't be preaching in this guy's name. But in Acts uh, 4 verse 12, it says that they, what they were saying is, there is salvation in no one else. No other name will you find salvation than in Jesus Christ, because He is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the only way. There's not another way. You can't get there some other way. He's the only way. Well, the religious leaders of the time, they, uh, they hadn't bought into Jesus being the Son of God and the Son of Man. They thought that He was a false prophet, and a lot of uh, Jews still today, and a lot of people around the world still believe that Jesus is a false prophet. However, He has been raised from the dead. He has been resurrected. He's alive and well today. In um, verse 4.19, they, uh, basically the religious leaders, they are berating Peter, John, the other apostles, and, and telling them that they can't preach in, in this name. And they say, well, um, who are we supposed to listen to? Are we supposed to listen to God or to man? They throw that question out there. And as you know, if... Um, if you're in court, if you're in trial, and, and you're kind of throwing things back at the judge, might not work out well in your favor, right? But for him, for these guys, they tell them, they tell the, uh, the leaders there, they say, we can't stop telling what we've seen and what we've heard. They've experienced Jesus. They've walked with him. They've talked with him. They've seen all the miracles. They've, they've lived it. They've experienced it. It's real. 
And they said, we can't stop telling what we've seen and what we've heard. You might want us to, but we can't. And we won't. We're not going to. And they prove that they're not going to. These guys, um, you know, we think that what they were going through might have been something like what we would possibly go through in a court hearing and, and in a trial, and the punishment might be the same, but it's not the same. Totally different place, totally different time, and the punishment was extreme, was very, very extreme, very severe. And these are the same people that they just watched brutally murder Jesus. And they're telling them, don't talk about that guy. You saw what happened to him. You want that to happen to you? They were pretty bold. But in uh, verse 21, you'll see that it says, uh, basically, they let them go, and they didn't punish them at this time due to fear of the people. Because they were in prison because they had just healed somebody that had been lame from birth. He couldn't walk his whole life. They healed him, and they were worried that if they punished these guys right now, that they themselves would get stoned by the people. And they may have been right, they may not have been right, but Peter, John, they get out of this one without, um, without any punishment necessarily, but they give them the direct command to not speak this anymore. You know, it says that everyone was praising God for this miraculous sign. Everybody had just seen this thing happen, and they were all giving God the glory. These leaders, they were the leaders that were supposed to be pointing people to God. God did something. All the people, it says all the people were praising God for this miraculous sign. They were praising the one true God. And the religious leaders, they just couldn't see it. They just couldn't see it. So, what do they do? Then they prayed. They prayed. Why did they pray? Because they were afraid. They've seen lots of people killed before on a cross. They knew that they had done it to Jesus. They would likely do it to them, but they weren't going to stop. And so they prayed. They prayed because they were in fear, naturally. The Word tells us not to fear. It tells us that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. But that doesn't mean that bad things won't happen. They knew this is the Messiah, Jesus is the Messiah, and yet these things still happen to him, so they could still happen to me. So they pray, and what they pray for is outstanding. They pray for boldness, and it says in uh, verse 29, it says, And now, O Lord, hear their threats. They're petitioning God to understand what it is that that's being leveled against them. They say, hear their threats and give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching. They don't say, make sure they don't do anything. They say, make us bold enough to preach your word regardless of the outcome. That's what they ask for. These, <laughs> this is awesome. Give us great boldness in preaching your word. And then they say, stretch out your hand with healing power. Remember, they just healed a guy that had been lame from birth, but they saw the results of that. Guy got healed. They give God glory. That's what they're looking for. They want God to get the glory here. So they ask him to stretch out his hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So they know that these signs and wonders, they aren't coming through them personally. They're coming through the name of Jesus and faith in that name. That's what they're asking for. They're not saying, heal people so that I'll get the glory. They're saying, heal people so that you will get the glory. We've seen the results of what happens when you move. So move again. And then it says in verse 31, I love this. After this prayer... The meeting place shook, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. What's that remind you of? The day of Pentecost, right? Go to the upper room, wait, and then you'll be subdued with power from on high. 
And it says a mighty wind rushes in. The whole place is shaken, loud noise, you know, everybody's filled with the Holy Spirit. Same thing happens again. The place shakes. I want this place to shake. I want us to shake. I want us to feel the shaking, to feel the power of the Holy Spirit surging through this place, surging through each and every one of you so that everybody that you touch will be impacted by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then it says, Then they preached the Word of God with boldness. They prayed, asked for boldness, boom. Holy Spirit comes, here's your help. Here's your boldness. And they preached with boldness. That's just absolutely outstanding. So then it goes on. Oh, and I did, I w- I did want to let you guys know that it is actually okay to ask for God to move with signs and and wonders. It is okay to ask for miracles. You know, and I know whenever I'm reading through this, and I think about um, whenever the people ask Jesus for signs and miracles, and he calls them a, a, you know, wicked and perverse generation, and they only want to see signs and miracles, there's a big difference between us asking for the signs and miracles and somebody just asking for him to prove himself. You know? Big difference. It's like whenever they said, if you're the Son of Man, come down off that cross, save yourself. Same kind of thing. Totally different whenever we're doing it. It's okay for you to ask. As long as you want Him to get the glory and not yourself. But I love that they got, they got what they asked for. And then it, it goes on, and, and Rod hit all this um, last week, but just as a refresher so that we can roll into chapter 5, it says, All the believers were united in heart and mind. I'm afraid we're not always united in heart and mind, are we? A lot of times we're concerned about ourselves, what we want, what we can get, what we should do, you know, all these different things. But Jesus prayed in John chapter 17 that we would all be one just as He is one with the Father. That we would all be one. That means the same heart, the same mind. Going after the same goals and that's Him being lifted on high to make Jesus known. And to know Him. But they were all in one heart and mind. And then it goes on and it's talking about how uh, they felt like they didn't own anything. Because they were servants. They were bond servants. Slaves to Jesus Christ. And so they knew that they didn't own anything. And everything that they had was from Him anyway. So it's not theirs. So they didn't view their possessions as their own. So if somebody else had need and they could help, they helped. If they had something to sell, they'd sell it and help. It, didn't, it doesn't say that everybody sold everything that they had and poured everything in. That's not what it says. And in one translation, it says from time to time, they would sell things and give as it was needed. You know? They did live a lot together. They did live life together. They were always together in the temple. They were, they were praying together. They were spending time with one another, having chili cook-offs and stuff. I mean, that's what we're doing, right? They did all these things. But it says that there were no needy people among them because those who owned any land or households would sell them and bring the money to the apostles and give it to those in need. Now, the apostles, they got to spend all this time with Jesus and watch Him provide everything that anybody needed turn water into wine, you know, feed 5,000 with loaves and fish and all these things multiple times, heal people. Whenever they needed something, it was there. A lot of times, I think it came right down to the wire. Does it ever come down to the wire with you guys? It does with me. It really does. But He always provides, and He provides for us through us a lot of times. There's been people in this congregation that have provided for me and my family in times of need. That provide for other people. And we try to provide for people in times of need. That's what we're called to do. But then, so rolling, setting the stage for chapter 5, it says, for instance, there was Joseph, the, one of the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi, and came from the island of Cyprus. He sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. 
This is one of uh, Jesus' disciples. He was right there with him all the time, and he had a field, you know? I don't know about you guys, but sometimes whenever I'm thinking about the disciples, it's like, well, did they even have anything? They just, they just left everything. Well, this guy still had a field that he could sell. You know, maybe whenever times were getting tough while he was with Jesus, maybe he thought about selling it then. But he didn't because the time wasn't right then. The time was right now, and so he does it. And, and imagine in this time, like it's literally listed in Acts because it was a big deal. Because it changed people's hearts and minds. So he does that, and he's probably getting, you know, praise for it. Like, hey, good job. That, that's awesome, you know. I'm sure that he was because people were around, you know. So naturally, they were going to do that. So then, right after that, verse uh, 5, chapter um, 1, chapter 5, verse 1, it says, But there was a certain man named Ananias who with his wife Sapphira sold some property. Okay, so, so right before this, Joseph sold something and brought the proceeds. And then the very next line, it says, Ananias, who with his wife Sapphira sold some property. He brought part of the money to the apostles, claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. You know, that's not a problem. That's not a problem. But what most people think is that he probably made a vow to actually give the whole amount, and then he and his wife conspired to actually keep some of it for themselves. So they're dealing with probably pride and greed are the two main things that they're dealing with here. Okay? I'll, I'll get into pride and greed here in a little bit. But... Um, All right, it says that, that they kept some of the money for themselves. And then Peter, remember, Peter just got out of, out of jail, right? And they go on and continue to preach and stuff. And so um, Ananias is bringing what's, what he wants to bring, the little bit left over, to Peter. And Peter was operating in the gift of knowledge of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit gives multiple different gifts, right? And one of those gifts is a gift of knowledge. Like he will tell you things that you wouldn't otherwise know. And I, I just try to imagine Peter here. He says, Ananias, have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not sell as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but you were lying to God. I don't think Peter cared if he brought any money or all the money. He just wanted him to be honest and do what God was leading him to do. But God gave him the knowledge and the understanding that Ananias and his wife Sapphira they weren't operating out of what God was wanting them to do. They were operating out of pride because they just saw Joseph do this and they saw how he was responded to. And they're like, hey, I want that same thing. But I also want more of the money. Doesn't really seem like a massive sin to us, right? Doesn't seem real huge. But let's see what happened. It says, as soon as Ananias heard these words, as soon as he heard the words, he fell to the floor and died. Whoa. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> Coincidence? Maybe. Probably not. Let's see what else happens. So then it says, everyone who heard about this was terrified. You think? I'd probably be a little terrified too. Then some young men got up after sitting there with their jaws on the floor, I'm sure, wrapped him up in a sheet and took him out and buried him. You know, I bet whenever Ananias fell down and died right there, there was probably no one more surprised than Peter. <laughs> Can you imagine? Like, nothing like this had happened since 
uh, Uzzah stuck his hand out to, to prop up the ark from falling over. You know, he was killed instantly. They hadn't seen anything like that. They hadn't seen God move like that since then, you know. And now he's seeing this right in front of him. But Oswald Chambers uh, made a statement. He said that worship is giving God the best he has given you. Giving back to God the best that he's given you. That is our act of worship. It's a true act of worship. You know, and the Word also tells us that you can either love God or you can love money. But you can't love them both. They don't go together. If you love God, He'll take care of the money. He'll take care of whatever you need. If you give yourself to Him as a servant, and this calls them servants, they call themselves servants, if you are a servant... You don't get to provide for yourself. You are provided whatever the master gives you. You live where he tells you to live. You wear what he tells you to wear. You do what he tells you to do, and he takes care of you. However he sees fit. We serve a master that truly does take care of all of our needs. It says he, he provides our needs according to his riches and his glory. But Ananias and Sapphira were trying to provide their own needs according to their riches so that they would get glory. See where we're, where we're going with this? Their hearts were full of pride and greed. And they were just like the religious leaders of the time. They were proudful and they were very greedy. And who did Jesus come to oppose? All the sinners? Or the religious leaders that were full of pride and greed? The religious leaders. That's who. Pretty, pretty amazing. You know, um, Peter says, Ananias, how did you let Satan fill your heart? He let Satan fill his heart. Jesus also called the religious leaders, the sons of Satan. It says, your father is Satan. That's, pretty, that's a pretty bold statement, but it's Jesus, so he can say whatever he feels like, and it's true, you know? But Peter uses kind of that same terminology. He says that you let Satan fill your heart. And he did. He absolutely did. You see... Satan can influence the life of believers, even spirit-filled ones. He can influence. I'm not saying he can control you, but he can influence you. He can whisper in your ear. You ever had that happen? You know that it's not God. You know that it's not what God wants you to do, but man, is it enticing, and you really want to do it. He can influence you. However, he can't do your sinning for you. He can influence you to sin, but he can't sin for you. Just like what he did with Job, remember? It says that Satan went to the council, is standing in front of God. And God says, you remember, you consider my servant Job? And Satan's like, oh, let me at him, let me at him. So then he starts doing all these things to influence Job to sin, but Job didn't sin. It's interesting. We can be influenced, but he's the one that, uh, he influences, but we're the one that does the sinning. So then whenever we move on, <clears throat> the young men had just taken Ananias out. And then it says about three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. In today's day and age, we would know, because we have cell phones and all those things, right? She had no idea what had happened. But she comes in, everybody in there was terrified at what God had just done, you know? And then it says that Peter asked her, 
Was this the price that that you guys got for selling selling that? And she said, "Yeah, that was the price." And I'm sure Peter's like, hmm. he was probably hoping that she wasn't conspiring with him. But they were one, you know. Sometimes we don't agree with our spouses. This would have been a good time for her. Um, But they did agree. They did conspire. This was something that they had agreed on. That's why people think that they probably made a vow that they were going to give everything. And then she says, yeah, that was absolutely the price. And Peter says, how could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord like this? How could you even consider testing the Lord? They probably didn't consider that it was testing the Lord, right? They were thinking, I want people to see me, and I want that money. But guys, every action has an equal or an opposite reaction. There's always consequences, good, bad, or indifferent, to your actions. They didn't think about those. And so, they both paid the price. Here's something interesting. So, uh, remember the guys that got up and wrapped up Ananias and took him out? So they're getting back. They're just now getting back from burying this dude. And Peter, uh, uh, I, I shouldn't laugh. It's really not a laughing subject, but it is, it's somewhat interesting to me. It says that um, Peter asked her, how could you guys conspire? And then he says, the young men who buried your husband, they're out, uh, just outside the door and they will carry you out too. And instantly, she died. Instantly. They were coming back. He knows it. And he says, they're going to take you too. Imagine being these dudes. (laughs) They just buried him. They go walking in. Peter's like, got another one. Sorry, that's just the way my mind works. Probably wasn't like that, but in my mind it was. And they're probably like, goodness sakes, we should have brought a donkey or something to carry these people. But anyhow, so instantly she fell to the floor and died. When the young men came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard what had happened. So they list the church and everyone else. Everybody in the church heard about this. Everybody's going to hear about it, right? Everybody. This rumor meal is rocking and rolling. So they all hear about it, but so does everybody else. And God used this to create a a respect. Uh, We call it fear, but it's an honor and a respect for God, like holding Him in awe, honestly, is what it is. So... I mentioned um, Uzzah, and that's in 2 Samuel 6, um, verses 6 through 8. It says that that Uzzah reached out his hand to steady the ark of God as it was carried by a cart with oxen. And then God's anger raged, and he killed him. We look at this, if you just look at it from up here, and you don't pay attention to the context of why this happened, you're like, how could a loving God do something like that? God put rules in place for his ark, and it was to be carried on the shoulders of the priests. One here, one here, one back there, one back there. That was how it was to be transported. This is the ark of the covenant of God. God resided with this thing, and it was to be treated with honor and respect. And he said, this is how I want you to carry my presence. But they took it and put it on a cart. Instead of doing what he said, David's taking it back, right? And so, these guys are praising and worshiping as they're walking along with this ark. And the cart hits a bump. The ark starts to fall off. Uzzah did what any of us would do. We don't want the ark to hit the ground. That would be horrible. So he reaches out, steadies it. Boom, the power of God kills him instantly. He was trying to do what he thought was right. It wasn't his idea to put it on a cart instead of carry it, right? He was trying to do what was right. But there's rules, and and God said, this is how it must be done. 
and they didn't follow those. It scared them to death. They're like, "Uh uh-oh, David said, that's not coming with me. We're leaving it here, you know? But God, God was using that. He used that incident to actually put the fear of God, the honor, the respect, the reverence in their hearts to do things the way that in proper order, okay? It has to be done in proper order. We've got to honor and respect God. So then in Acts 5.5, 5, it says, as soon as, as uh, Ananias heard this, he fell on the floor dead. <clears throat> I think that, that it's kind of the, the same thing. God's using that as kind of the same thing. Like, if he continued to kill everybody that didn't operate exactly like uh, we were supposed to, I wouldn't be here. I would have been dead forever ago. And so would you, right? But he's, he's showing right up front, this is the way this is supposed to be done. You should do things in order. You should honor me. <clears throat> After this, like I said, everybody was terrified, right? But then it goes on, and in verse 12 it says, The apostles were performing many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. So they had prayed that God would do this. Make them bold and allow them to perform signs and wonders, even more than what they were doing, and they were. So now they were actually performing more signs and wonders. And it says, All the believers were meeting regularly at the temple, um, in the temple area known as Solomon's Colon. Solomon's colonnade, but no one else dared to join them, even though all the people had high regard for them. They were, they were kind of scared of the power of God. They were somewhat fearful. I'm sure Ananias and Sapphira were, were saying that they were Christians too. You know, they followed this most high God and he struck them down and they're like, mm. I mean, I see all the cool things you're doing. I want it, but I'm, I'm a little worried. Because if you killed them, you're definitely going to kill me. That's what I would have been thinking. You know? But then, it says, Yet more and more people believed and were brought to the Lord. Crowds of both men and women. Uh, they, they made that delineation between men and women because a lot of times in those cultures, the women didn't have the right to be able to serve the way that the men did. And he's making it very clear. It's men and women. Everybody can come to Jesus. Everybody can come to the Father through Him. And then it says, and as a result of the apostles' work, they had to do something to get results. So many times, we just want God to work without us doing anything. We want, we want the results. We just don't want to put in the effort. You know? But God requires us to put in effort. He requires us to do. And then... He will move. He requires us to seek His face, to call on His name. They put in the work, and then sick people were brought out into the streets on beds and mats so that Peter's shadow might even fall across some of them as he went by. Doesn't that seem a little odd? That they, they heard all these things that were going on. These wild, miraculous things are happening. People are getting healed, sick. Uh, demons being cast out, all these things, and they, they're hearing it from so many people, got to be real. So that builds their faith. Faith comes from hearing, hearing the Word of God, hearing the truth. So they're hearing it, right? And imagine the way that people are communicating what has happened. Whenever we go out, and sometimes, you know, we, we take teams out to go street evangelize, or we're, we're sitting next to somebody and we start talking to them about God, you know? And, and our relationship with Jesus. And it might not have a whole lot of passion inside it. You might just be doing it because you feel like, well, God wants me to tell people about Him. If they don't see passion and fire in you, if you're not passionate about Him, why are they going to be? Why would we expect them to want to know this God that can do all these mighty, wonderful things if we're not even passionate about it? He saved you from the pit of hell. No matter what you go through here, when you step from this world into eternity, guess what? 
You get to step into eternity with Him. We should be really passionate and excited about that. He saved your sins. He saved my sins. That's why we took communion today, right? Blood was shed. His body was ripped and torn apart. He became sin. He who knew no sin became it. He didn't take it on. He didn't put it on like a cloak. He didn't, you know, you didn't hand it to him. He became it. He became your sin. And that's why the Word says that it pleased God to punish Him. People are like, how can, how can this God, this Almighty God, punish His Son, do this to His Son? Because He became all the sin of the world, from the first sin that was ever committed to the last sin that was ever committed, not just yours, but mine and every single other person's. Think about all the atrocities that happen in this world. That's why God was able to, it, to be pleased when Jesus was punished. It wasn't because He was punishing His little sweet baby boy. He was punishing every sin that the world had ever committed. And He did it so He didn't have to punish you. And He didn't have to punish me. That's why. So these people are hearing about all these, these things, these signs and wonders that are happening. They're hearing about it and people are passionate because, hey, my kid just got healed from, from epilepsy or my kid just got a demon cast out of him. You know? Um, this kid that couldn't see, whatever. Imagine your kid gets healed from something that there was no hope, and now they're healed. Aren't you going to be a little passionate whenever you tell people? And they're going to believe it, right? And so these people are hearing this, and they're like, i got to get to at least let a shadow hit it. At least let them be hit by a shadow. What does that remind you? It reminded me of, of Matthew 9, 20 verses... Uh, Matthew chapter 9, verses 20 through 22, and it's the woman with the issue of blood. She's been bleeding profusely. Nobody could help her, but she knew if I just touch the hem of his garment, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. He doesn't even have to look at me. He doesn't have to say anything to me. I will be healed. I know I will. And her faith made her well, right? And then the Roman, uh, the Roman officer he goes, and he, his servant is very, very sick, on the brink of death, and he says, hey, just, just say the word. You don't even have to go. I've heard what you can do. I believe that the power is real. Just say it, and, and he'll be healed. And so Jesus says, I haven't found faith like this in all of Israel. But because of it, go ahead. They're healed. Done. It was done. It was done. That's why these people could go up and actually think, that the, just the shadow would heal them. So do you think that, that that shadow actually did its work? Well, let's read on. It says that sick people were brought out into the streets on beds and mats that Peter's shadow might fall across some of them as he went by. Next, the very next sentence says, Crowds came from the villages around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those possessed by evil spirits, and they were all healed. They were all healed. It doesn't say some of them. It doesn't say the ones that uh, really had, had a good relationship with God. No. It said they were all healed. All means all. I know you've heard that before, but it's absolutely still true. All absolutely means all. So, the very next verse, in, in uh, verse 17, it says, The high priest and the officials, who were Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. I'll tell you right now, jealousy is evil. And if, if you have this root of jealousy in you, you're not going to be able to see God. You're not going to be able to hear God. He's not going to be able to communicate to you because your eyes are fogged over. You can't see anything but that. Has anybody ever been jealous before about anything? I'm sure you have. Maybe it was back when you were younger in school or something, but whatever. It's evil. Jealousy is evil. So they were so jealous that they arrested the apostles again. <laughs> they go back to jail. Back to jail. And I know, you know, we're like, Pastor Rod went back to jail. <laughs> what do you do this time? Same old thing, just preaching the word. But they arrested them and put them in a public jail. 
this would not have been nice. It wouldn't have been clean, all that stuff. I told you guys about the jail that um, was over in Rome that I saw that, that um, Paul was probably in. It says, but the angel of the Lord came at night. So they're in jail. The angel of the Lord came at night and opened the gates of the jail and brought them out. <laughs> you know, this is, I love this because like the word says, no weapon formed against me will prosper. No weapon formed against you will prosper. If it's in God's will and he knows that you're going to do what he tells you to do, guess what? He's going to make a way where there is no way. He's going to part that Red Sea. He's going to break open the doors of this jail. He's going to take you out. You're going to do, if, if he's called you to do something, he's going to equip you to get it done. Might not be easy, might not be fun, might be really painful. You might feel more pain with this than anything you've ever experienced in your life. That's an absolute fact. Following God is not easy. It's not. It's not for the faint of heart. I said that the other day. Because you will suffer. You will struggle in this world. It's an absolute guarantee. So, this angel comes and breaks him out of jail. I love it, man. It's like having that really good ride or die. You know that even if you go to jail, I'm coming to get you. It's like I tell my girls. Look, I don't care if you're in a bad spot, even if you're doing something you probably shouldn't be doing, you call me, I'm going to come get you. Depending on how bad the spot is, you might see your dad do things you've never seen before. I, whenever I'm thinking of this, you know, and this angel breaks him out of jail, I can't help but think of the phrase, but God. No matter what we're going through, might be bad, but God. You can't take him out of the equation. He's in the equation because he never leaves us and he doesn't forsake us. You can't count him out. You might be locked up in prison with your feet in bondages like these guys were, but it ain't over till it's over, you know? So continue. I just want to encourage you, continue to put your faith, hope, and trust in the one who can save. So they open uh, the gate. <laughs> uh, the angel of the Lord came at night. It was in the middle of the night. He broke him out at night. That's probably a good idea, you know, so people didn't see him leaving. Opened the gates of the jail and brought them out. But here's the cool thing. It says, then he told them. He didn't just take them out and then disappear. He did that with Peter once before. But he breaks them out, and then he tells them what to do. He says, Go to the temple and give the people this message of life. I want you to continue to do what got you in there in the first place. Continue to be bold. Continue to do it. And so, listen to what they did. At daybreak. The very next morning. The sun's coming up and they're headed back into town going right back to the same place that got them in trouble in the first place. I love that. They are determined. And they're willing to be obedient regardless. Obedience is the key. It really is. Obedience is the key. Do you think that that angel would have shown up if whenever they got out, they were going back to the house to kick back and not ever preach the word again? Not likely. I can't guarantee it because it didn't happen in here. But it's not likely. So, they get told what to do. They're obedient. At daybreak, the apostles entered the temple, and as they were told, um, and immediately began teaching. Immediately. I love that. It's not delayed, it's not, uh, delayed obedience. It's immediate obedience. The right thing at the wrong time is still wrong. Okay? It really is. The right thing at the wrong time is still wrong. So, when the high priest and his officials arrive, so they get, they get um, where they're supposed to be going the next day, and it says that they convened the council. They have no idea that they aren't in jail anymore. They're walking around all big and bold, and you know they're like, we're killing somebody today, dude. That, I mean, they probably didn't say that. It's not written in here, but... They convened the high council, the full assembly of the elders of Israel. It says the full assembly of the elders. So 
all the elders come together because they know they have a problem on their hands. There's a big problem here. These guys are winning a lot of converts. They're doing what we've told them not to do, and they continue to do it. So let's get everybody together to figure out what we're going to do. We're going to put a plan in place, and we're going to execute this thing. And I want everybody here tomorrow morning, and they all show up tomorrow morning. Then they sent for the apostles to be brought from the jail to the trial. But when the temple guards went to the jail, the men were gone. <laughs> I'd love to see their faces. So they returned to the council and reported, Hey, listen, the jail was securely locked. I think they were trying to save the guards' butt there. The jail was securely locked. <laughs> and the men were gone. The jail was securely locked, with the guards standing outside. But when we opened the gates, no one was there. I don't know what happened, <laughs> you know. Listen, we're going to find out a little bit later. If you have ever read Acts before, you're going to come to a spot where uh, these guys are saved again, out of jail again. And the guard gets ready to kill himself. There's another part where these guys get out and they're executed for letting these guys escape. It wasn't their fault. <laughs> God, God blinded them, you know, but they're killed for it anyway. It was a big deal to let your prisoners go missing. And here they go missing. But sounds to me like these guards got to keep their lives. But I think it's pretty, uh, <laughs> pretty fun to talk about. So it says, when the captain of the temple guard and the leading priest heard this, they were perplexed. Wondering where it would all end. They were really surprised, right? Perplexed is like dumbfounded. I have no clue what's going on. But then they know what's, what's been going on with these guys. And they're asking themselves, where will it all end? I, I think that's probably a pretty logical question for them, right? It says, then some, um, someone arrived with startling news. <laughs> Paul Bunyan's coming or something, right? It says, he arrives with startling news. He says, the men you put in jail, they're standing in the temple teaching the people. They're back doing what you put them in jail for. <laughs> I think that's hilarious. I would have loved to have been that guy, you know? I would have loved to have seen the looks on these people's faces whenever they realized the guys that we just locked up last night that all of a sudden disappeared are back doing what I told them not to do. And they get furious, right? It says, so then um, the captain with his temple guards went and arrested the apostles. They arrest them again, but without violence this time, for they were afraid of the people, I would imagine. I would imagine they were probably afraid of the people, and they might be a little afraid of these apostles that uh, can simply vanish and show back up. But they were afraid that the people would stone them. Probably, probably a fair assessment, I think. It says, so then they brought the apostles before the high council where the, um, where the high priest confronted them. We gave you strict orders to never again teach in this man's name, he said. But instead, you have filled all of Jerusalem with the teaching about him, and you want to make us responsible for his death. Newsflash, you are responsible for his death. You killed him, <laughs> you know. I, fortunately, they didn't respond exactly like that, but I would have. It says, but Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than any human authority. Then he points out, he says, the God of our ancestors, this is the God that these guys represent, the God that they believe in, the father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? The same God, he's saying, the same God that you guys worship and that you represent, that you're supposed to represent, this same one raised Jesus from the dead after you killed him by hanging him on a cross. And some, some versions say on a tree, um, but by hanging them on a cross. Then God, though, you did this, but then God put him in the place of honor at his right hand as a prince and savior. As prince and savior. That's huge to uh, understand. God put him in this place of leadership and authority. They felt like, as, as the religious leaders they were put in that role by God. And honestly, they were put in that role by God. But God causes leaders to rise and He causes leaders to fall. 
Just because they had the position doesn't mean they had the heart. Okay? But that same God made him prince and savior. He did this. Why did he do it? So that the people of Israel would repent of their sins and be forgiven. That's the whole purpose. He did it so that we would repent and be forgiven. That tells us you can be forgiven. He's even saying, you're part of Israel. If you repent, you can be forgiven. It says, we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit. This is a kind of a kicker, like a kick in the guts. It says, and so is the Holy Spirit who gives by God to those who obey Him. So then it says, when they heard this, the high council was furious and decided to kill them. All right, we're doing it. We're, we're killing you. This is the last draw. And they're all getting all frustrated, all riled, you know. They're about ready to put these dudes to death. It says, but one member, a Pharisee, so you got the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Rod laid that out the other day. You got this one member, he's a Pharisee named uh, Gamaliel. Whenever I, I heard this name, I'm like, wait a minute, is that the same dude that taught Paul, that, that Paul was taught under? And so I looked it up, and it is, it is the same guy. You can find that in Acts um, 22, verse 3. Paul goes on and talks about it. Whenever you look that up, it, basically, Paul is is trying to communicate with these people. And he says that I was brought up and trained by um, Gamaliel. And as his student, I was carefully trained in our Jewish laws and customs. I became very zealous to honor God in everything I did, just like all of you today. They wanted to kill Paul. And he's saying, I get it. I was there. But Paul, remember that he was there whenever Stephen was murdered? He was the first martyr uh, for Christ. Paul was the one holding all their cloaks of the dudes that stoned him to death. He's saying, believe me, I'm, I'm pretty zealous, and I was raised up under this guy. So this, that's the guy that we're talking about here. He says, um, it goes on and it says that he was an expert in religious law and, um, and respected by all the people. So this guy stands up, and he orders that the men be sent outside the council chambers for a while. He said to his colleagues, men of Israel, you better pay attention to what we're doing here. You better be careful about what you're doing. It says, take care what you are planning to do to these men. He says, some time ago, there was a fellow um, named uh, Theudas who um, pretended to do some great things. He was pretended to be somebody great, and about 400 other people joined him, but he was killed, and all those followers went... Uh, went astray. They went their own various directions, right? And then it says, the whole movement came to nothing. After him, at the time of the census, there was Judas of Galilee. He got people to follow him, but he was killed too, and all of his followers were scattered. He's saying, this could be just like that. It very well could be one of those things. He says, so my advice is, and these people did listen to him, because he was way up in the, in the chain of authority, um, very respected. He says, so my advice is to leave them alone. Let them go if they're planning, um, if they are planning and doing these things merely on their own, it will soon be overthrown just like the others. But, this guy says, but, here's something to keep in mind. If it's from God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You may even find yourself fighting against God. He's like, I don't know for sure, but have you seen what they're doing? Have you seen the things that are going on? If this is of God, not saying it is, but if it is, you're going to be fighting against God. Not something you want to do. So, then... The others accepted his advice. They're like, that's probably pretty, pretty good counsel. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Some say beaten, like some versions say beaten. But if you, if you look up that actual definition of that word right there that they translated to flogged, it could also mean skinned. Skinned. So it's the same thing that happened to Jesus. 
the 39 lashes. That's what this is. They had them brought in and whipped 39 times, and it skinned their backs. It literally shredded their backs open. Hmm. That doesn't sound fun. It says that um, it would strip the skin off their backs, and people had been known to die from it. From just this, this one thing. But when Jesus went through that, it says that he was bruised for our transgressions. He was wounded for our iniquities. And by his stripes were healed. By this, the thing that he took on, we're healed because of that. That's what this communion that we just took represents. The body and the blood. The body was broken. It was torn. It was shredded. And the blood that was poured out was for us. It says, so they beat them. They did this to them, and then they ordered them to never again speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. So it's like, you know, we're going to follow your advice, but we're not letting them go for nothing. You know, we're going to teach them a lesson here. They will respect us. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a quick story. Well, I'll tell you here in just a second. The apostles, this happens to them. And it says the apostles left the high council crying and, and, and whimpering and, and promising that they'll never do this. No, that's absolutely not what happened. These guys went through this and it says when they left, they were rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for his name. Man, that's some power there, you know? That is some, some love, some determination. They didn't go through that for themselves. They went through it for God. They went through it for Him. Just like you would take it for your own kids, you know? They went through it for Him because of what He had done. So, many years ago, I've got three little girls, like this, stair step, right? And uh, they did something that required discipline, and so I brought them all up, and I couldn't guarantee who was telling the truth and who wasn't, but we had three kids and more than one story, right? And I remember being a kid and getting wrongfully punished for something that my brother did one time, and I was like, that's so wrong. He did that. And over time, I realized, eh, I mean, I got away with a lot. So I kind of, <laughs> it evened out a little bit, right? Yeah, it evened out. We'll call it even. But I, I, I have to bring them upstairs, and I'm wanting them to tell me the truth. And I'm sure one of them was telling me the truth. I know one of them was telling me the truth. I just couldn't be sure which one, right? So I line them all three up, and I get out the paint stir stick to swat them, and they're all lined up. First one, whack, whack, whack. Ah! Second one, whack, whack, whack. Exactly the same as first. Ah! Third one, whack, whack, whack. And she goes, looks back at me and I was like, oh crap, or oh darn. Um, and then the other two say, you didn't spank her as hard. I don't know if you remember this. There's only two of the three here today. Oh, no, the third one's here. Where's she at? Over there? Okay. But it was at that moment um, that I realized there's there's some uh, strong, strong will here. And uh, she said, do you remember exactly what you said? It was Azrael, my youngest daughter. She's, 
<laughs> she says, uh, um, I wasn't going to cry, so I just, <clears throat> just held, held my breath and looked back. I wasn't going to cry. She wasn't going to give me that satisfaction, you know? And I remember what they were doing. The three of them were down in the basement, and I hear all kinds of screaming break out, right? Screaming and yelling and hollering, and it was bad. You, you know whenever you got normal screams, and then you got, it just got bad screams? <laughs> yeah, Lonnie's kids are back there. Yeah, I know that. Yep. Well, it, we had the, it just got bad screams. So that's why I had to bring them up. And uh, apparently, they were picking on Azrael, and she started beating on them. Sorry, baby. You were, they were just kids. They were kids. Okay. Obviously, that wouldn't happen anymore. All right. But uh, I said, I told Azrael, I said, baby, don't you know that you're smaller than them and they can, they can hit harder than you? And she goes, no, they can't. <laughs> I mean, indignant. She's like, you've lost your mind. <laughs> of course they can't. You know, she was 100% guaranteed. And uh, I, because I had told the girls, I said, well, if she starts to hit you, this probably isn't a great parenting moment, but I said, hit them back, you know, uh, hit her back. And, and they said, we do, but she just hits us harder. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So there you go. But um, these, <laughs> these guys, they left there with their backs shredded, rejoicing that they got to suffer for Christ's sake. They rejoiced that they got to partake in His suffering, that they got to relate with Jesus. They had seen Him beat and whipped and having to drag His cross through the, through the streets up to Golgotha. They saw all those things. And they had all just left Him. You know, they had all denied Him. They all ran away. And so, after running away from your best friend and watching him go through these things, naturally you go, you, you feel remorse. You're like, I should have been there. I should have, that should have been me. Have you ever heard somebody say, that should have been me. I had a friend fall off the water tower due to some equipment that broke. And I was on it literally one minute earlier. And there was no reason that it didn't break on me. I wasn't married, didn't have kids, nothing. He was engaged, and she was pregnant and had a baby on the way. And I thought, that should have been me. Why, God? Why would you let this happen to him? He's clearly got more going for him. You know? These guys, they probably, in the moment of seeing Jesus being tortured and killed, ultimately killed, probably were thinking, that should have been me. Well, now it is them. Now it is them. They are going to go through those things. All of them are murdered except John. And, I mean, he might as well have been with everything that he went through. But they, they rejoiced. And they, they, counted, they rejoiced because they were counted worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. And then, they still didn't stop. <laughs> it says, and every day in the temple and from house to house, they continued to teach and preach this message that Jesus is the Messiah. Did they stop? No, they just rolled on. They just continued. It would have been difficult to continue. It really would have been. But um, they didn't. They, they didn't stop. They continued on. And it was literally for the hope set before them. They were being obedient no matter the cost. So I encourage you guys, no matter what we go through, what we're getting ready to go through, what you have been through, or whatever, continue to be obedient. You will have your reward. You will. It is worth it. It's not easy. But it is worth it. Um, if anybody has anything that they want prayer for, you can come up 
afterwards. We didn't release our kids, so you already have them. If you're missing some, um, I'm sure they're probably around here somewhere. And remember, we are going to have the chili thing afterwards, but um, if you do want prayer, if uh, you have anything that you need healing for, if you know somebody that needs healing, we will uh, gladly pray for them for healing. We'll gladly pray for you for healing. If you are at a place where you're like, you know what? I don't really have a relationship with this Jesus that these guys suffered so much for, but I want one. And I'm willing to do whatever it takes. Then come up here afterwards. We'll, we'll walk you through it. We'll talk you through it. And you won't leave here the same. Jesus can be your personal Lord and Savior as well. So, let's pray real quick. Heavenly Father, good morning. God, we love you so much. We thank you for all the sacrifices that you've made so that we can have a relationship with you, Lord. We thank you for your son, Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for everything that you went through, knowing knowing the pain that you would have to go through, you endured the cross because of the joy set before you, because of us, because of this relationship that we can have with you. And thank you for sending us your Holy Spirit, the helper, to lead us and guide us and direct us into all truth. Holy Spirit, thank you for being there for us. Thank you for being in us and leading and guiding us, God. We love you and we appreciate you. God, I pray that whenever the time comes, that we will not shy away, that we will not back down, that we will not remain silent, but that we will proclaim the good works that you have done and that, Jesus, that you are the Messiah and that you are the only way, the truth, and the life, the only way to get to the Father, the only way to have true eternal life in heaven and not in hell. Thank you so much. Lord, I pray that you will bless the people here, God, I pray that you will um, grace us with boldness to proclaim the gospel. I pray that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit and that you will subdue us with power from on high, God, and that everywhere that we go, we will impact the world around us for your kingdom, that we will impact people, Lord, and make us, make us bold to share our testimony. Make us bold to preach your name, God. Lord, I pray that um, the kingdom of heaven will be added to because of us, because of what you are doing in us and through us, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.